Hi everyone, Cody here. So I cut out this one meter by one meter square of fiber board here. I laid it on the ground and I got to thinking, besides a cat, what is above this square? Like if I had an imaginary box around it and like it was the floor of the box and that rectangular prism extended all the way up to space, then what is inside that volume? Well, air of course, but air is kind of hard to visualize on the account of it being transparent. So let's say I took all of the air that was inside that imaginary box and I condensed it down. I liquefied it to the density of water so that I can represent it as being water. How much water would I have to have to equal the amount of mass of air that's above every square meter at sea level? Well, this much. 10,300 liters of water is the equivalent mass of the air above a square meter at sea level. Like each of these intermediate bulk containers contains a thousand liters of water. I have 10 of them here. And that wasn't quite enough. I had to add another container with another 300 liters here at the end. That puts it into perspective. <laughs> now, I'd love to have these stacked up on top of each other so you could see how high it is, but these containers, once I got more than like two or three of them stacked on top of each other, the weight of the water would just crush the bottom one. So I couldn't do that. Instead, you'll have to kind of shift your perspective and imagine this is a, a tower here on top of this square. That's 10 meters high. 30 feet or so. <laughs> now, of course, you might have noticed I'm up here in the mountains. I'm not at sea level. In fact, I'm about two kilometers above sea level. So where would I have to put this square to equal the amount of atmosphere that's actually above me, that's actually above the square right now? Well, right about here. So two and a bit of these containers full of water is the amount of mass of air that is below me. Like if I dug a shaft all the way down to sea level, that was one square meter on the surface and two kilometers down, the amount of mass of air inside that shaft would be two and a bit of these containers here. And if I took all of the Earth's atmosphere, except for what was in that shaft, and made it disappear, now that gas inside that shaft is going to expand. You know, gases want to expand to fill their whole container. You have to compress them to keep them down. So how much force would I have to apply to this square to keep it stuck down to the surface of that shaft to keep it on as the lid? Well, I'd have to have eight of these totes stacked up on top of each other to provide enough force. In fact, that's kind of what's happening right now. You see, the gas molecules that are here, they're colliding with the piece of material and they're bouncing off, colliding with other gas molecules and maybe coming back and colliding again, and that's putting force on the material. But that force is, of course, balanced by the force that is being applied by the gas molecules colliding with it on the other side. You know, these over here are experiencing the force that's applied by the weight of the atmosphere above. But these over here that are underneath, well, those are being supplied by the force of the atmosphere above. It's just being deflected off the ground and coming back, right? It's a fluid. It moves in and it can fill in and push up as well. And if this was a two-kilometer shaft, the gas molecules that are right here next to the board they don't know that. They're just colliding with other gas molecules. So whether it's two centimeters or two kilometers, it's virtually the same. The gas is able to compress in all directions and also on the inside of the fibers, there's air in there as well pushing out. So there's no net force on this piece of material. Like I'm able to move it around freely, right? But if this was instead on top of a vacuum chamber, 
Say that shaft was dug but not allowed to fill with air. Well, the air above would be pushing down, but they wouldn't have any gas molecules pushing back up. And so there would be a net force, which at this altitude would be the equivalent of eight tons of water on top pushing down on this one meter square here. If I was at sea level and this was on top of a vacuum chamber, there's no air inside of it, it'd be 10 tons of pressure pushing down on that square. Now, something else that's kind of mind-blowing is if instead of a vertical shaft, if I had a horizontal one, one meter on each side, but 10 kilometers long, that way it could reach all the way down to my neighbors down there. So you can see their buildings. They're about 10 kilometers away. And at my altitude, the density of the air is about 80% of what it is at sea level. At sea level, it's 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. Up here, it's about one, which is nice for the math. 10,000 cubic meters of air that I'm looking through to see my neighbors would weigh 10,000 kilograms. The equivalent of 10 of these totes full of water. I'm basically looking through 10 meters of water, equivalent mass, in order to see my neighbors. And to look into space, I'm only looking through eight cubic meters of water equivalent. I guess saying cubic is not really needed because if it was pencil thin, it'd still be 10 meters of water, right? But yeah, you get the idea. There's more air between my neighbors and me than there is between the space station when it's flying overhead. And actually, those mountains are up in the distance. They're about 35 kilometers away. There's more air between me and them than there is mass between me and the edge of the Hubble horizon, the edge of the universe. If I were to travel as far as possible, get in a spaceship and fly forever, I would never encounter more mass than there is between me and those hills over there. Now that does assume that you don't end up running into a star or planet. That would obviously be more mass. But the chances of that are very low. How low? Well, think about it. If every possible path that your ship could take would intersect a star, every straight line of sight has a star in it, then the night sky would be as bright as the surface of a star. It would be as bright as the sun all over. This is not the case. In fact, most of the sky, an average patch the size of the sun, has around a trillionth the brightness. So the chances of running into a star are about that, one in a trillion. But how could that be? You know, that's such a short distance. And the edge of the universe is billions of light years away. Well, this column that's horizontal, the air is at a constant density the whole way. The air that's going up vertical is a constantly decreasing density. Remember, just coming up two kilometers, I'm now above two of these totes worth of water. I'm above 20% of the atmosphere. If I go another two kilometers, I'd be above almost the same amount again. If I go to 15 kilometers of altitude, I would be above 90% of the atmosphere. There'd be nine of these totes below me and only one equivalent mass above me. And if I go another 15 kilometers, then it'd be 90% again and again and again. Eventually the air gets so low density because there's so little air above it compressing it that we just call that space. We just consider that to be a vacuum. But it never goes to fully zero. There's always a little bit of gas. Even as you go out into interplanetary space, you can find particles of the Earth's atmosphere. There's just so few of them per volume that we just consider that to be zero. The amount that we lose from the sun blowing it away is tiny compared to the amount that we have, right? There's a lot of air here. If you lose uh, 100,000 tons a year, that's 
tiny. It's enough to last billions of years. And indeed, it's exactly what's happened. The atmosphere has been able to stay stable for billions of years just because the Earth's gravity is able to hold it down. Its own weight is compressing it down to the surface. If you think about it, something similar is happening inside of a vacuum cleaner. The impeller of a vacuum spins really fast, and the air inside of it is also rotated, and that creates artificial gravity, which throws the material out to the side with thousands of times the normal force of gravity. And so you can get the same amount of gas compression in a few centimeters as you would in a kilometer of height. In fact, when your vacuum cleaner is running, it's creating about the amount of suction equivalent to about one of these totes worth of air removed. It's able to make about one ton of force per square meter. Of course, it depends on the vacuum. I'm sure sun could go more. Theoretically, it could go up to 10 if you got a perfect vacuum created. Uh, speaking of never running out, well, I've got these here. I thought I'd also talk a little bit about the composition of the atmosphere. So the atmosphere is about 78% nitrogen, so that'd be about eight of these full of nitrogen. And 21% oxygen, so about two full of oxygen. And the remainder of the carbon dioxide, water vapor, argon, neon, etc. would all fit in the last little bit. That means you've got two tons of oxygen over every square meter at sea level. And actually, the altitude I'm at, less than 5% of the Earth's surface is at this altitude or higher. So let's say it is two tons, you know, forget about the 0.1 because of parts of the Earth that are at high altitude. There's two tons of oxygen per every square meter of the Earth. The Earth has a lot of square meters. And that's every square meter. That's ice caps, tundra, deserts, rainforests, oceans, all have two tons of oxygen over top of them. How much carbon do you have over top of every square meter? Here, maybe a few grams worth of carbon. In the middle of a rainforest, you might have a ton or so. But over the oceans, especially the middle of the oceans, deserts, ice caps, tundra, that number might be near zero. And you remember the carbon cycle. Plants take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, they produce oxygen, they store the carbon in their bodies, and then when they're burned, that carbon dioxide can get released again, right? It consumes oxygen and releases carbon dioxide again. So for every ton of carbon, you need two tons of oxygen to burn it. But you've got two tons of oxygen available for every square meter of the Earth's surface. You don't have that much carbon on every square meter of the Earth's surface. Even if you include fossil fuel deposits, it's still... You have a thousand times more oxygen than there is by mass burnable carbon. You could burn all of the carbon on Earth. Every fossil fuel deposit, every tree, every bug, every bit of algae, burn it all. You consume oxygen to do it. And the amount that the oxygen would decrease would be the equivalent of a couple of liters per square meter. You, would, you wouldn't notice it. You'd notice the increase in carbon dioxide, sure, because that would be significant. It'd bring it from 400 parts per million up to whatever that would be. Maybe, I see 1% is 10,000 parts per million. I'd probably increase it by another 1,000 parts per million or so, yeah. That'd be the equivalent of going inside of a normal house, the CO2 level increase. You could walk around on the surface of the Earth after such an event and you wouldn't even notice. You could still breathe. There'd be plenty of oxygen. But how could that be? Like, where'd all that oxygen come from? You got the carbon cycle, right? It should, it should balance. You should be making the same amount of oxygen as you'd be burning. Well, the thing is, atmospheric escape. Some gases are able to escape easier than others. Helium and hydrogen are light gases, and those are able to escape much more quickly. They're lighter. They take less energy for a photon from the sun to knock them off the atmosphere. They expand more 
you take more altitude to get the same amount of pressure with those gases. So hydrogen is able to leave the Earth entirely, just through normal escape. Oxygen sticks around, though. Now, when algae is photosynthesizing and making oxygen, it's also making a little bit of hydrogen. You know, it's just a waste product. It's a... Not a waste product. It's a, it's a co-product that is wasted. It's wasted energy to make the hydrogen. Uh, life has gotten pretty good at not making hydrogen, but it does make a little bit still. And you've also got, like, when there's a fire or something and it pyrolyzes the... Uh, wood chars it makes wood gas some of that gas doesn't burn well, that contains a significant amount of hydrogen and all those sources of hydrogen over the eons have been leaving the earth leaving the oxygen behind so the carbon's basically been acting as a catalyst converting water into hydrogen and oxygen using the sunlight as energy and the hydrogen's leaving the planet and the oxygen staying behind making the planet more and more oxygenated our atmosphere is built up over billions of years. Well, at least a billion years. Since the great oxidation event when life forms started forming oxygen instead of being anaerobic. But uh, if we stopped producing oxygen today, the oxygen that's here might stick around for 200 million years before you'd noticeably decrease the amount. And that would be the amount that would be you know, consumed by weathering into rocks and such. You know, you take tectonic activity in order to recycle that much oxygen. Yeah. I thought this was kind of cool to see. Kind of blows your mind when you think about it. Hope you enjoyed. I'll see you next time.